To Christian friends, brothers and sisters in God's family, God's word tells us on the very first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women went to the tomb, found the stone, rolled away, heard the announcement from the angel that Jesus had risen from the dead, and found that Mary Magdalene had actually seen the living Lord Jesus. What an exciting morning. But as everything happened on that Easter morning, there was something even equally exciting that happened that Easter evening. And we see, sometimes overlook the fact that something extremely important also happened that evening. As we look back and examine what took place, we see that Jesus, our Lord, sends us out with his peace and with his authority to forgive and to withhold forgiveness. On that first Easter evening, the fearful disciples had met to reflect upon the events of that day. They had heard that Jesus had risen from the dead. And then all of a sudden, there is Jesus right in the middle of them, even though they were behind locked doors. And the first thing he says to them is, Peace be with you. A common greeting at that time. But then a little bit later, he again says to them, Peace be with you. Now, put yourself in the, the situation of the disciples. What do you think they needed at that time? What do you think they were feeling at that time? Perhaps a bit terrified that maybe they were next on the chopping block to be killed as Jesus' disciples? Perhaps thinking back to that Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus had repeatedly asked them to watch and pray, what did they do? They fell asleep again and again. And then when the temple guard came to take Jesus captive, what did they do? Well, they ran away. And so they very well may have these feelings of overwhelming feelings of grief and shame and guilt. There is no chance for them to go back and say, I'm sorry, I apologize. He died the very next day. There's no chance for them to say, we'll just be a little bit more faithful. No. And there he was. Something so truly amazing happens. There he is standing right in front of them. And what does he say in the first words? Oh, how are you guys doing? Hi? Are oh, you really turned out to be some lousy disciples? No. Peace be with you. There's nothing any longer that stands between you and a holy God. I have come and lived the holy life that you could not live, and I'm going to give you my holiness. And I'm the one who has suffered the torments of hell in your place, paying the punishment for every one of your sins. Now you are forgiven. Now you have true peace with God. And the disciples aren't the only ones that needed that reassurance that their sins were forgiven. Do you ever feel yourself carrying some burdens that have brought you shame and some guilt and some grief? Have you ever felt like you've let the Lord down, that there's days that maybe you've desperately wished you could go back and not have said those words or done those things that have affected you? Have you ever laid awake at night wondering if God was a million miles away, felt so separated from him, wondered where he was? You ever think about how many times you have messed up how many times you've been inconsiderate of other people? How many times you've sinned against the holy God himself who has loved you with an everlasting love? And then, and then what does he say? The apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, the good I would not, that I do. The evil I would not, that I do. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Well, we know who rescues us from the body of death, who rescues us from our sins and our failures. It's Jesus who comes to us, you and me, with those same powerful words, peace be with you. And what he said to those disciples on that first Easter evening, he says to us time and time again, in how many different ways you come to Lord's Supper today, what are you going to be hearing again? My body given for you, my blood shed for you, for what? For the forgiveness of sins, and then what? Depart in peace. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. I don't think there's anything more important that any, any human soul, sinful soul, 
needs than to hear those words of God. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Wow. In Scripture, the Lord tells us, since we have been justified through faith, justified, declared innocent of our sins by God himself through faith, believing what he has done for you, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how often don't you hear in our worship services to God's spokesmen, his, his ambassador, his representatives, your pastors, grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Yeah, why should he give us peace that goes beyond our human understanding, our own human wisdom? Or at the close of the service, the Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Wow. Those are more than just pious wishes. Those are statements of fact. Act based on God's word. Jesus has made peace with us and he no longer holds us accountable for our sins. When you think about it, that's a pretty powerful statement to pass on to other people. And people might say, well, how can you have the right to give, offer peace to people or to offer this forgiveness to them? Well, that's our Lord Jesus again. As he comes to those disciples and to us, he makes it very clear to them. In that same night, he gave the authority to forgive sins and not forgive sins to his believers on earth, to his church. It says here, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Sometimes people misunderstand that to think that we are the ones that decide who is forgiven and who isn't forgiven. Now, perhaps a better translation might be if you forgive anyone their sins, they have already been forgiven by God himself. Because God is the one who establishes the criteria on which we are to forgive people or not forgive people. He says in 1 John, if we confess, that is admit, acknowledge our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, all of our sins. But if we claim we have not sinned, we should decide. We make God out to be a liar. His word has no place in our lives. You see in Psalm 51, a broken and a contrite heart. The Lord will not despise. That's the heart that receives forgiveness and to whom we are to offer that forgiveness. In other words, God promises to forgive the sins of those who acknowledge their sins and believe that Jesus has paid the full price for those sins. And God promises to withhold forgiveness to those who refuse that forgiveness and then sees no need for forgiveness. Then God gives his church the authority to withhold forgiveness from such a person. That authority to announce forgiveness or to withhold forgiveness is called the ministry of the keys, which is explained by in Luther's small catechism with the words, it is that special power and right which Christ gives to his church on earth to forgive the sins of the penitent sinners, but refuse forgiveness to the impenitent as long as they do not repent. Think about that awesome power that God has placed into our hands. The privilege of announcing to a sinner in the name of Jesus, the door of heaven is open to you. You are forgiven. You are at peace with God. And when we make that declaration, in the words of Martin Luther, we're told, it is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. Cherish that privilege to offer that forgiving key that unlocks heaven. Along with the privilege of using the key that unlocks heaven, Jesus also gives us responsibility of using the key that locks heaven to people. And that is to withhold that forgiveness. He gives us that authority to pass on that key, to withhold that forgiveness. Not because Jesus did not pay for their sins. He certainly did. But they see no need for it. They will continue on deliberately sinning. They determined to cling to their sin instead of turning away from it. And then that locking key or that withholding of forgiveness must be applied. That means if you deliberately go on, plan to divorce your spouse with any biblical grounds, 
deliberately keep on having sexual relations outside of the marriage relationship. They continue to despise God's word and the sacraments by deliberately staying away from his word, not reading his word, not caring about worship or your God. If you continue to forget or just to, to show by your words and action that you regard your sin as something trivial, well then, God says, and he gives to his believers the right and responsibility to do what? To tell you, with your, tell you where you stand with God out of love and concern for your soul. That's a hard thing for people to hear. You see, but as long as you remain impenitent, you stand outside of God's kingdom. God's, heaven's doors are still closed to you. You are still in your sins. You are not forgiven. You're on your way to hell. It's just that plain. You're not at peace with God. And God makes it very clear. If you deliberately keep on sinning after you have the knowledge of the truth, you know what God says, and you don't do it. That's that hard heart. I don't care what you say, God. Then there's no sacrifice for sins left. Then Christ on the cross isn't going to do you one bit of good. Only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Oh, does he put that clear? And the Old Testament reminds us, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked, for those who want to continue in their sins. Period. And you might say, well, why would Christ want to have his church send that message out? That's certainly not very popular, that you may be going to hell because of the way you're living. Oh, it's not a popular message. But our God is more interested in having the names of people written in the book of life than he is in the membership role of some church. He wants souls in heaven. If people are living in impenitence, well, then they're living outside of God's kingdom. They already are not a member of God's kingdom. And they shouldn't fool themselves. And we should not... Permit them to continue in their sin. We are to reach out to them and show them the seriousness of their sin out of love and concern for their souls. And so you might hear people being removed from membership, excommunicated from membership, because we're reaching out for people for their soul's sake, because we haven't seen them for weeks on end, years on end. I do want that soul in heaven out of love for their soul. That's the key, that's the concern that needs to be taken care of. And so when that is being proclaimed, and through the power of the Holy Spirit it is proclaimed, and souls are turned around, then we rejoice with the angels, we are told. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Yes, we can say, you are not lost. You are part of God's family again. You are forgiven, you have peace with God. There's nothing better that we could say to a, a straying sheep than those words to pass on. It's not just for the pastors, it's for every Christian who loves the Lord and loves other souls. And these are the, every person you meet. They are treasured souls of God who he wants up in heaven. And he uses people like you and me to pass on that good news, how important it is to have a Savior who comes to you and to me and says, Peace be with you. Yes, peace be with you. The Lord sends us out with his peace. He gives us that power to forgive or not forgive sins. Amen.